Hi friends, I'm Mother Sylvia at St. Mark's and first I want to say thank you for your interest in learning more about or serving as an acolyte or a servant of worship at St. Mark's. Before we jump right into what an acolyte does, it's important to talk about how and why acolytes do what they do. You'll notice that on the sign-in board in the entrance to the church, acolytes sign in where it says servants of worship. As an acolyte, you are a leader in the liturgy. But as Jesus taught his disciples, those who would be greatest must be the servants of all. Never forget that when you're an acolyte, you are serving God and you are serving the people of God. When you are serving in worship, you are helping all of the people of God set aside distractions and enter fully into the presence of the living God. You have been called to lead the people. So as you lead worship, you carry yourself with dignity and with reverence, with love and with grace, and with mindfulness and attention, allowing each step, each gesture, to point people more and more towards God. Because as a servant of worship, we want not to draw attention to ourselves. We want to help people focus on God. And so we use our own eyes and our bodies in ways that help direct people's focus where it should be, whether it's to the preacher, to the altar, to the gospel book. Now let's talk about what you do as an acolyte starting when you arrive. The first thing you do is sign in on the check-in board. Ideally, acolytes should arrive about 30 minutes before the beginning of the service. When you sign in, notice who else is on your team for the day. The crucifer carries the cross. Because the cross always leads the way, the crucifer is usually the most experienced acolyte and often the tallest acolyte. The torch bearers carry the candles or the torches. The candles light the way for the gospel. Because they move as a pair, it's important for the torch bearers to coordinate their movements. It's also helpful for the torch bearers to be similar heights. The gospel bearer carries the gospel book on behalf of the deacon. This is an important job and it can be a great starting place for new acolytes as long as their arms are strong enough to hold the gospel book high for all to see. This is, after all, the good news of God in our midst. The servants of worship have to be flexible, depending on how many people are available to serve on any given Sunday. If there's only one acolyte, that acolyte will serve as the crucifer. If there are two, one will be the crucifer and one will carry the gospel. If there are three, one will be the crucifer and two will be torch bearers. When there are four, one will be the crucifer, two will be torch bearers, and one will carry the gospel. If there are additional servants of worship, there might even be a second cross, as well as the children's cross and the children's candles. Now it's time to get dressed, or as we say in church, it's time to vest. You can go through the library to the vesting room. There you'll find the closet that says assigned robes. You should find vestments that fit you on a hanger in the closet. Before you are scheduled to serve, you should come into the church and find a set of vestments that fits you. Then label it with a tag and your name so that it's easy to find. The appropriate vestments for acolytes include a cassock, which is a robe, at St. Mark's, we have black cassocks for taller people and red cassocks for shorter people. Acolytes wear a white surplice over the top of their cassock. Now that you're vested, it's time to light the candles. Ideally, the torchbearers would light the candles about 10 minutes before the service begins. First, you get the official candle lighters.
notice that the candle lighters have a nifty lever whereby you retract and extend the wick. Next, you get a lighter from the drawer in the sacristy. Then you carefully light the wicks on each candle lighter. Next, you carefully and reverently light the candles, beginning always with the Paschal candle when it's there. Next, you light the candles behind the altar, which are called the office lights. You start with the candle nearest to the cross and work your way out. Then you turn and light the candles that are on the altar. Whenever you cross in front of the altar, you bow to the cross. Don't forget to light the icon candles in front. Fun fact, you can extinguish the candle by pulling down the wick. Ten minutes before the service, it's also time to ring the church bells. The rope for the church bell is located on the stairs up to the choir loft. There are a variety of traditions around ringing the church bell. When in doubt, ringing the bell 12 times is a good rule of thumb. The crucifer or the gospel bearer can ring the bell while the torch bearers light the candles. If possible, you should invite a younger child to help you. Once the candles are lit and the bells have been rung, it's time to line up for the entrance procession. Torch bearers, get your torches from the closet. And light them using the lighter in the sacristy. Gospel bearer, get the gospel book, either from the front gospel book stand or at the back of the church. And crucifer, Choose the cross you'll carry in procession at the back of the church. Now it's time for the service to begin. The service begins with the entrance procession during the opening hymn or during Lent in the silence. The cross always leads the way, followed by the torches. The torches light the way for the gospel. After the gospel book comes the children's cross and then all of the children carrying candles. The clergy come at the end of the line. Walk slowly and reverently as if you are entering into the throne room of a king. When you come to the front of the church, it's customary to pause, to reverence the cross and the altar. The cross and the torches ascend the stairs while the gospel book, followed by the children's cross and children's candles, turn to the right and enthrone the gospel book on the stand near the icon. While the young children return to their pews, the gospel bearer goes through the side door to meet the other acolytes in the chapel. In the side chapel, the torch bearers secure their torches on the wall under the icon and the crucifer secures the cross either in a cross stand or against the wall. Then all of the acolytes reverently enter the chancel, reverence the altar, and take their seats. Before we move on, now is a great time to pause and review some do's and don'ts for acolytes in procession. Pay attention to your posture. Don't let your arms hang limp. Don't look tired or bored or like you're waiting for a bus. Do stand tall and straight with your arms at right angles, your eyes and heart lifted up. Don't look sloppy and careless like you're chilling with friends at a party. Your face and your body when you're serving in worship should communicate joy and also dignity and reverence. The work that we're doing together in worship matters. It isn't about being perfect, but it is about doing everything with attention and love and care. Don't get lost in your own world or get distracted or let your torches go all higgledy-piggledy. Do pay attention to what's happening around you. Pay attention to what's happening with your own body. Pay attention to your fellow acolytes and priests and liturgical leaders. Remember, you're a team. Now back to the service. After the entrance procession, 
There are some prayers and some songs, usually a Gloria or a Shema. Then the first reading, the psalm, and the second reading. As the second reading ends, it's time to get ready for the gospel procession. The gospel bearer will reverence the altar, then go down to get to the gospel book. The crucifer and torch bearers will go into the chapel to get the cross and the torches, while the priest invites the children of the congregation forward to carry the children's cross and candles in the gospel procession. Normally, the crucifer and the big cross leads every procession, but in the gospel procession, the children's cross leads. As it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, and a little child shall lead them. So the order for the gospel procession is children's cross, then children with small candles, then torch bearers with big candles, lighting the way for the gospel book, then the deacon, and then the crucifer with the big cross. Even if it feels heavy, the gospel bearer should hold the gospel book up high and proud. This is God's good news coming down into the midst of God's people. We want everyone to be able to see it. Torch bearers stop right after the opening in the pews and turn to face each other. The gospel bearer turns to face the deacon and opens the gospel book for the deacon to read. Don't look bored and don't hold the gospel book by the side because you might cover the words that the deacon is trying to read. Instead, hold the book from underneath so that it's easy for the deacon to see and cradle it like the precious treasure that it is. The gospel is over. The gospel bearer steps to one side to allow the torches to pass. And then the cross, followed by the torches, followed by the gospel, make their way once more to the front of the church. The gospel bearer enthrones the gospel on the stand near the icon, then goes through the side door to meet the other acolytes in the chapel. At this time, the torch bearers should extinguish their candles. Then they enter together, reverence the cross, and take their seats for the sermon. Now comes the hardest part of the service for many acolytes. It's time to sit and listen and model active listening and participation for the whole congregation. Very young acolytes may choose after the gospel procession is complete to go into the parish hall and participate in children's chapel. While the liturgy continues with the sermon and silence, the creed and the prayers. When you're sitting up front, the whole church can see you. So it's okay to be bored. You just can't look bored. So try to sit up straight, keep your feet together, your hands in your lap, your eyes open. Your example actually helps everyone in the congregation listen better. If you're someone who listens best when you have something to do with your hands, try leaving a set of prayer beads near your chair when you're acolyting so that you have something prayerful to do with your hands while you're listening. And if you really need to move your body or have a coughing fit or use the bathroom, just excuse yourself into the chapel for a moment and return to your seat as inconspicuously as possible when you're ready. After the liturgy of the word comes the passing of the peace, and now it's time to prepare for the Eucharist. During the offertory, the acolytes help the deacon set the table. There is a small side table called the Credence Table, which the Altar Guild has prepared before the service with everything we'll need for the Eucharist. There's also a handy-dandy diagram near the table to remind you what is there and in what order you should pass it to the deacon. First comes the corporal, the large white linen folded in a square. The word corporal comes from the word that means body. The corporal is like a holy placemat that holds the body of Christ in the Eucharist. Next comes the paten, the plate with the large loaf of bread for the Eucharist. Next comes the chalice, the large cup that will hold the wine for the Eucharist covered by a white linen napkin called a purificator. Now that the cup is on the table, it's time for the wine. The wine come in small pitchers called cruets or sometimes a flagon. 
be sure to hand the pitcher to the deacon with the handle facing out so that it's easy for the deacon to take hold of it. Next, come the pitcher of water, again, with the handle facing the deacon. The deacon will take the water, pour a little bit into the wine to be used for the Eucharist, and then return the water to you. When you receive the water, put it back on the credence table. Next, come two silver boxes filled with wafers. One is regular and one is gluten-free. These wafers are called host and are also bread to be used for the Eucharist. The little boxes are sometimes called the host boxes or the picks. You can remove the lids from the picks and leave them on the credence table and hand the open boxes to the deacon. Last but not least is the altar book and its stand. Now the table is set. We are almost ready for the Eucharist. All that is left is to receive the offering. An acolyte, usually the gospel bearer, meets the ushers at the steps. Then the acolyte carries the offering to the high altar and presents it to the priest. With this gesture, the acolyte on behalf of the congregation offers not only our money, but our whole lives to God. Now it is time for the Eucharist. During the Eucharistic prayer, the acolytes are responsible for the ringing of the Sanctus bells. As the prayer begins, an acolyte, normally the crucifer, perhaps assisted by the gospel bearer, step into the chapel. There, on the counter, you will find a cushion with the Sanctus bells and a binder with the full text of the prayer. The word Sanctus is Latin for holy. And we ring the Sanctus bells when we sing Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. You ring the bells with a strong twist of the wrist. There are other points in the prayer when we ring the bells too. They are usually marked on the prayer in the binder. We ring the bells with the holy, holy, holy. Joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Holy, holy, holy Lord. You ring the bells once after the priest lifts up the bread and says, do this for the remembrance of me. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the priest lifts high the chalice and says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this for the remembrance of me. And finally, at the end of the prayer, when the priest lifts high the bread and the wine and all the people say, Amen. Amen. Now the acolytes should be ready to assist with communion, however they're needed. The torch bearers may be needed to assist with the distribution of wine. The crucifer or gospel bearer should stand on the steps right behind the priests, ready to provide additional bread or gluten-free wafers whenever they're needed. At the end of communion, all of the acolytes help clear the table. Items are taken from the altar and carried reverently into the chapel where they're set on the chapel altar. This is also the time to make sure that the torches are lit for the final procession. As you led the people of God into God's presence at the beginning of the service, now you lead the people of God out to continue their service in the world. As the closing hymn begins, all the acolytes go into the chapel. The gospel bearer comes around to get the gospel book. The crucifer gets their cross and the torch bearers their torches. The crucifer watches for the priest's signal, a nod or a bow, before coming out of the chapel and taking their places. When the priest bows before the altar, the crucifer turns around and leads the procession out. First the cross, then the torches, then the gospel book falls in line. After that, the children's cross and any children with candles and the clergy bring up the end of the line.
Now the service has ended, but your job has not. First, you need to put everything away. The crucifer returns the cross to its stand. The gospel bearer returns the gospel to its place. The torch bearers blow out their torches and put them away in the closet. Then the torch bearers extinguish the candles. Generally, you extinguish candles in the reverse order of how you lit them. First, the candles on the altar, then the office lights behind the altar, beginning on the outside, working your way into the cross. Don't forget to extinguish the icon candles. Otherwise, you might burn the church down. You're almost done. You take off your vestments and no. You guys, you hang them up on your hanger. And you put them away in the closet. And now it's time to go. Thank you so much for your service to God and to God's people. Have fun, and may your ministry as a servant of worship bring you, as well as our congregation, deeper into the presence of God.